If you're able, please stand as we read God's holy word from the fourth chapter of Jonah. And some Bibles have this kind of heading, Jonah's anger at the Lord's compassion. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, while I was still at home? That is, what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. <clears throat> Excuse me. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, like the Mojave Desert, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also so many animals? Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to the Lord. Well, compassion is a dangerous word. I think it's dangerous sometimes when we have words that we think we know what they mean, but we don't really know what they mean. We use it almost without understanding what compassion means. We know that, obviously, that compassion is generally a good thing, but what is it really? Compassion. What does compassion look like for believers? Where are our limitations? Where should they be? And how does God look at compassion? These are all good, difficult questions to sometimes answer, but we're going to look to our text to address those, and hopefully at the end we'll see what Christ-like compassion looks like. But before we get too far, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bring your word today, that your text would speak to our heart, and as you spoke to Jonah and to the readers of Jonah, that you speak to our hearts even today, that we as believers can understand through the power of the Holy Spirit what it is that you want to jump off the page and dive into our heart. Lord, I pray that we would listen and that we would hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the, the text that we have for today just kind of jumps right in. It basically, uh, it, it, it's pulling off. It's a story as it goes through. It tells what was happening before. But just as a reminder, in case you weren't here last week, that the Ninevites go through perhaps the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. The most heartfelt, demonstrative repentance in all of history. And Jonah's ticked. He says, that won't do. Jonah is so mad, he's angry at God. And he has words with God. And he says, he says, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen, God. I told you this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. And the Lord asked the penetrating question to Jonah. 
is it right for you to be angry? Now that's one of those phrases in the Bible I would love to hear the tone of the voice in because there's a lot of different ways we could understand that. It definitely could read it as a like a looking down your nose sort of, is it right for you to be angry? You could also look at it as like a compassionate sort of question, is it right for you to be angry? There's lots of different ways to look at it. I think there's a sense, though, that the Lord is kind of edging Jonah. So I like to think of it, the fact that it's not being judgmental of it, so much as it, obviously he knows the right or wrong, but God's asking him this question. Well, Jonah doesn't answer the question, but he grumps his way all the way out of town. He's just kind of, I can see him just like kicking the dirt, doing all these different things as he goes along. He gets out of town. He sets up a shop at the local 7-Eleven Camel Stop or whatever they've got going on there. He sets up a little shelter just to kind of keep the sun off of him. It's not really great. But he picks up his chair and he faces town to see what's going to happen. You know, I, I, I will say that I've skipped over that verse so many times. never thought about the fact that Jonah goes to town and then he sits there and he kind of faces town and he just kind of goes like this. And he's just like, he's like I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. They're not going to be judged. God is compassionate. God is going to let them get off. They're going to be able to be reconciled to God. So he was hot at God, and it was pretty hot out there. So the Lord provided a plant, and he gave him some shade. And he says, much appreciated, Lord. Thank you for that plant. That's really, it's hot out here. But what does God do? The next day, God provides a worm. He provides a worm. And it's interesting that the text is an aside that talk about providing the fish. And God provides the worm, and then he provides the scorching heat. I mean, God's provision doesn't always come like we expect it. But God provides this worm to kill the plant. And then he brings the sun blazing down on Jonah's head. And as the sun blazes, as, as the heat bears down and the Santa Ana winds flow in and all that sort of thing, he's getting really warm. In fact, speaking of warm, I asked them to turn down the temperature in here a few, day, a few uh, minutes ago. The, uh, I, I, as an aside, I, uh, you know how the, when there's a big fire, they send, it's like a five alarm, alarm fire. There's five, well, once you see about five fans going, you know, people doing that sort of stuff, then, uh, then you need to turn down the the temperature. So it's a five, five fan uh, heat wave or something like that. So if you're warm, hopefully it'll cool off a little bit. I'm the one with the jacket standing up front though, in front of the lights. So I'm warm, I will say. So going back to the text, Jonah brings his edgy attitude and he says, Lord, just kill me. Kill me now. You know, I'd rather be dead. It'd be better if I'm dead. And the Lord comes and asks him a similar question as before, but this time he asks him the question about the plant. He says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? This time Jonah is going to get into it with the Lord. He rolls up his sleeves and says, yes, Lord, yes, it's right for me to be angry about the plant. And then God lets that shoe drop. He says, you have great compassion for that plant. How about those people down there? And with that story, or with that, the story ends very abruptly. So what exactly is going on here? I'm going to highlight a few things that are going on in the text, uh, and then we're going to move beyond that uh, passage and to talk a little bit about what it means for us. Well, first of all, I want to tackle this, this interesting thing of, is it right? Is it right? You know, so many times when I hear people say that word today, I, another one of those dangerous words, do you really know what the word right means? I have the right to fill in the blank of whatever like that. And you're like, really? You have the right to that? There are some things that perhaps we can say at least are inalienable rights by our country and so forth, but a lot of times we tend to think that we have the right to things that we're not talking about. But in this case, he says, is it right? What does he mean there? Well, the Lord is asking this question. Do you think that the Lord doesn't know the answer to his question? Who here thinks that the Lord doesn't know? Okay, that's a good sign. We all think that the Lord knows the answer to the question. So why does he ask it? Why does he ask a question that he knows the answer to? Because he thinks Jonah doesn't know the answer. In fact, he knows that Jonah doesn't know the answer to the question. He's asking a prompting question. Is it right? It's not a rhetorical question. It's more of a, a prompting question to get Jonah to think about the answer. He's not learning to be instructed, but he's learning to teach might be a way to say it. It's meant to penetrate and show Jonah what it is that he's missing 
in the circumstances. So what does it mean by it's, it's right? Is it right? Well, there's two aspects I'd say of this. There's probably more than two, but there's two I'd like to bring out. First, is it right in the sense, are you right or justified in your being angry? Is it right? Is it correct for you to be justified in holding your position? So is your anger warranted? Is God's compassion that he had upon the Ninevites, as verse, indicate, as verse 1 indicates, is it as Jonah saw, he saw that this was very wrong. This is just wrong, he's saying, at least how it seemed to Jonah. And his anger burns because Nineveh didn't get the calamity that Jonah felt that they deserved. So is God wrong? If Jonah is right, then God must be wrong. Well, that's one aspect in there that we'll explore. The other one is the idea of, are you right about wanting Nineveh to be overturned? That's almost kind of like a secondary part of that question. So are you correct in your anger, but are also, is your anger even founded in the right place? Is it appropriate? Is it suitable for you to have that sort of anger? If Jonah can be compassionate to a leafy plant, why then is it wrong for God to have compassion on people? And Jonah answers the Lord's question in that he complies in answering the question, but he apparently misses the underlying point of the questions. So what is it that the Lord is trying to show Jonah? Well, as I mentioned, I think, last week, one of the things we talk about, 40 days and then Nineveh will be overturned. That word overturn, turn over, is a very similar sort of thing as being changed and being repentant. And I think that in a certain sense you could say that God is trying to overturn Jonah. He's trying to get him to see what is reality. Perhaps it could even be said that God's compassion on Nineveh struck at exactly the chord of what he wanted to teach Jonah. As I was studying through this passage, it it struck me even more than before why God would even pick Jonah to deliver this message. Why not somebody else? Why, when Jonah didn't want want to do it, why didn't he pick somebody else? Perhaps the Ninevites were the primary goal of God's compassion, or perhaps they were the target of God's compassion simply because they were the very people that Jonah hated so much. And the Lord wanted to teach Jonah. And we certainly have that representation of Jonah as God's people. He's certainly a prophet. But we have to be careful that we don't release ourselves too much. Jonah's name means dove, which is is a symbol of believing people. So Jonah is being edgy with the Lord. I picked that word because I thought it would be fun to talk a little bit about. What do I mean by that? He's, he's edgy and he's angry. He's, he's intensely um, irritated with him. But he's also edgy in the sense that his compassion has edges. It has borders. He says, I will show compassion on whomever, Jonah, I feel worthy. On whomever I, Jonah, am pleased to show mercy. Those whom I think deserve pity and care will get my concern. Those unworthy in my eyes will not receive it. And if there ever was a people more unworthy than these Ninevites. So there are edges, there are limits and borders to his compassion. This far and no further. And that's why he had such a problem of going to the Ninevites. And he's also edgy with the Lord because he's irritated at the reality of God's mercy extending beyond his own not out of pride or anything like that, but that it would reach to an undeserving and to a territory of terrible people. And I think in a certain sense, we let ourselves off the hooks too easily if we place all that burden on Jonah. I think we can understand this. There are probably people in the world that we might all agree are less deserving of mercy than most of the others. And the Ninevites... We have our own Ninevites of our day, might be a way to say it. They're brutal. They're corrupt, maniacally evil. Fill in the blank there. They are the terrible and the worst of the worst. Yet in our own estimation, we draw those lines as well. Certainly, there are those that don't deserve God's compassion. But perhaps our lines are in different places than the Lord's. 
Perhaps we think the people who deserve compassion are not nearly as deserving as we think they are. Jonah's hatred, though, blinds him to the raw reality of God's compassion towards him, himself, Jonah. Prophets in the Old Testament had a big part in railing on injustice before God. And here we have a prophet of God decrying the injustice of grace. That's an unusual thing. The injustice of grace, which the Lord gives to the Ninevites, all the while, by inference, accepting the Lord's compassion, grace, and patience with him, with Jonah, he is God's holy prophet, and he won't do what God wants him to do. He's deserving of death, and yet he saves him, and yet he brings him, and is, is, is slow to anger with him. And he, he's trying to tell Jonah, Look at your own life. You see that you are thankful for your compassion, but that doesn't translate into your heart. He's blinded by his hatred, and somehow he sees himself as perhaps more deserving, and that his compassion, or the Lord's compassion upon him, is somehow more warranted. And that's just the same thing that we do when we draw our lines of compassion. So, what's the Lord doing? The Lord is showing Jonah that compassion is deeper than he knows and that true compassion flows from a loving and changed heart. I'll say that again. The Lord is showing Jonah that compassion is deeper than he knows and true compassion flows from a loving and changed heart. What is compassion? More specifically, what is compa compassion with God? Well, compassion is not just something that God bestows upon somebody. It is in the very essence of who he is as God. It's the essence of his character. Jonah acknowledges this in verse 2. He says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Jonah acknowledges this, and although he acknowledges this, he doesn't understand how greatly he underestimates the concept of God's character. Jonah knew that the Lord was all these things, at least he can list them, but he doesn't truly understand the items on the list, at least not at the depth level which the Lord would have him know. You see, compassion, you see, isn't just a gift. It's intrinsic to God's character. Jonah points this out, and he knows it, and that's why he gets mad at God, because he knows that about him. And true compassion in us flows from a loving and changed heart. We can't show true compassion until our heart is deeply changed enough to understand how much it is that we've received, how much we've been forgiven, despite our best efforts to get away from God. Jonah ran from God, but we run from God in many ways too. Because despite our best efforts, God persists and seeks us out. A gift of exceptional merit, all given despite our lack of merit of the gift. The worth, worthiness of the gift is independent of the worthiness or lack thereof of the recipient. And if we get that, if we understand that, if we know it deeply, then we cannot be unchanged. We have to be transformed. We must let compassion flow out of our changed heart. And in so doing, we demonstrate and witness to the character of God himself. I will say, as I was digging into that, one of the things that was most difficult for me to try and phrase on that as I put in there a loving and changed heart, I'd say for us, it flows out of a changed heart, but I had to keep in the idea of loving because God doesn't change. So it doesn't just flow out of a changed heart. God's heart has always been loving, and our heart is changed and becoming more loving all the time as we know him more. So if we show compassion, we demonstrate and witness to the character of God himself. So we talked a little bit about what the Lord is doing in trying to show Jonah. But what is he trying to show us? What is the Lord trying to show us as Christians? What does it mean for us as Christians? 
Well, I would say that a Christian's life is decidedly compassionate to others without limitation. It, it's decidedly compassionate to others without limitation. That is, it's, it's a life that's marked by compassion, marked by mercy for others unequivocally and undeniably sold out to the conviction that compassion is a mark of what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a Christian. A Christian's life is decidedly compassionate to others without limitation. And I like that word decidedly because I do believe there is a decision that we decide to be compassionate. It's not just a sentiment. Some people perhaps are more naturally compassionate, but we are all called to com be compassionate as the Lord is. So as Christians, we show compassion to others not necessarily because we feel like it, or because they even deserve it. And I think a lot of times as Christians, we decide who we want to be compassionate on based on whether or not we think that they are repentant enough. And who's a judge of whether they are repentant enough? That was a short pause. Usually us. We usually feel that we're the judge of who's repentant enough, who's deserved enough for our compassion. We show compassion to others. We show compassion to others because we are the Lord's. Because it is intrinsic to his nature and as his nature, his being is marked by compassion, then we as his children should reflect that same thing. We as his chosen people are to show compassion to others. We are to be demarcated by our love and our mercy to others, not just to the down and out, but perhaps even to the most hated, the most vile, of people. And you know what? That can be a tough thing to stomach at times. So let's think about a little bit about how Christ showed this compassion. And then we see in the New Testament, he came to all sorts of people. He had people constantly looking over his shoulder saying, what are you going and talking to them for? But Christ kept walking over those lines he had compassion on them, and he, and he spoke of compassion as well. He spoke of loving our neighbor, and then he straightened us out and shook us up quite a bit of telling us exactly who our neighbor was and what it even meant. He spoke of the unforgiving servant and showed us that compassion and mercy must follow if we truly understand the gift that we've been given. And he modeled it in how he walked through his life with patience and compassion. So what does Christ-like compassion look like? What are some things that we can pull out of the passage anyways? Well, I would say that Christ-like compassion, first of all, has no edges, has no borders. We started to talk about it. There's no limits to that compassion. We don't say, well, we are compassionate until. Whatever you put after that until is you got to be careful because you start putting those things after the until, and all of a sudden you have to say, is that according to God? Or is that according to me? And we tend to put those things. Jesus eliminated ed edges. Let's look at how he did it. He eliminated edges. He reached across ethnic borders, cultural barriers, cultural norms, gender walls, and even loved those who hated him. We see him, he loved even those who were rejecting him actively. How hard that must have been. You see him, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he cares more about their souls than they care about their own. So it doesn't have any edges. It doesn't have any borders. And it comes from a loving heart. It comes, compassion is an attitude, a heart attitude, not a gift to the worthy. Sometimes we think of compassion as us bestowing upon that. And Jonah, if anybody has shown himself unworthy of compassion. And yet, he's very thankful for the Lord's compassion. He's thankful for that plant. He's thankful for that one day of that plant. And yet, he doesn't understand what compassion really means. Compassion is, an, a, heart, is a heart attitude. It flows from the heart. And if our compassion is limited, then we need to look to our heart. If we see a place that our compassion is limited, we have to say, where is our heart in this? Because our heart is where the compassion or lack thereof flowed out of. 
So think of an illustration. So if, if the blood in our veins isn't pumping fast enough for the arteries to the veins, I know I like that, I'm not a... But if the blood in our arteries, in our veins, isn't pumping fast enough, where is the doctor going to look to? Well, I'm not a doctor. I can ask my wife next week when she's here. But a doctor is most likely going to look to the heart. Where is this coming from? Why is it not pumping enough? Where is it blocked? The doctor will look to the heart because that's the source of where it comes as it moves through us. So compassion comes from a loving heart. And the final thing I wanted to bring up is that compassion is what I would say is a decision first and a desire second. A decision first and a desire second. Of course we want to get to the point where compassion is second nature. We want to get to the point where we desire to, do, to be compassionate. But if we wait for that desire to happen, then we may miss the chance to be compassionate. We can nurture our, that by remembering the compassion and mercy that we've been shown by God. But compassion has to first be a decision. We need to decide to be compassionate, to be, decide to be like God and to reflect his character. Because a tough, loving compassion requires that we care for those who need it in God's eyes, regardless of our own. We tend to be like Jonah. We are compassionate enough to suit our own sense of deservedness, but we draw lines and edges of our own making rather than considering, considering whether the Lord ever had a line there in the first place. If it's a decision, then we do it and pray, pray that our hearts will follow and that the Lord would help us to learn how to love mercy, as it says in Micah. Can we love that? But we don't start with the love and then decide when we feel like it. So Christ-like compassion doesn't have edges or borders. It comes from a loving heart attitude, and it's a decision first and a desire second. And that's what it looks like when we say that a Christian's life is decidedly compassionate to others without limitation. So let's take a moment for just a second and imagine what that would look like. What it would be like to be that person who had Christ-like compassion. There would be no lines of division in our hearts. When we looked at another person, we wouldn't see them with our own eyes. We'd see them with God's eyes. Is that person loved by God? No matter their background, their ethnicity, their heritage, even their poor uh, life decisions or what they wear, there are things in the church I'm sorry, these are things in the church that over time we've oftentimes succeeded at, but oftentimes failed at. The church in general, and perhaps even our own church, we need to look at ourselves and trying to say, what does it look like to show Christ-like compassion to those around us? But let's turn it up a notch. I won't say turn up the heat because then everybody get warm again, but I just said it there. Let's turn it up a notch. Can we show compassion to those who hate us, who speak badly about us as Christians, those who try to tear down the church and all Christ stands for? Can we show compassion to those who are, by any account, don't deserve our compassion? Do we show them compassion anyway? Despite the gossip, despite the face, in the face, baseless accusations, even regardless of our own personal detestations to a person or people that deserve to a person or people that deserve anything before ever deserving God's compassion do we show them compassion because after all it's God's compassion if so we can identify with the compassion that the Lord was calling Jonah to because the Lord is showing that jo Jonah that compassion is deeper than he knows and that it flows from a loving and changed heart. So just kind of wrap this up. The ending in our text, you noticed it probably. It's very abrupt. It just kind of drops off there. There's several places in the scriptures that it does that, and every time it does that, I want you to remember to put a question mark. Why does it do that? Does it do it because they ran out of ink? They, the typists sprained their finger. They weren't typing. I was just kidding. But what exactly happened? 
What's going on? Well, there, it's, a, it's a, a literary trope or it's a, it's a um, maybe a literary device might be a better way to say it, that it's, it's a, a means to try and leave it hanging on purpose. It's a cliffhanger of sorts. When you watch a TV show and they go to the end, it isn't any mistake that they say, oh, I'm going to die, and then goes to black. They do that on purpose because they want you to watch the next show. Well, in this case, it's not so much that he wants you to read the book of Micah, which is right after Jonah. That's not what's going on. He wants you to think about what it is that's going on and what that means. The abrupt ending leaves a question hanging to be answered in our own story. How do we answer that? How should Jonah have answered the question and then turn it around to ourselves? How should we answer the question in our lives? And that question is for us. And I'm not talking about the question in verse 11 specifically, but the question behind it. Are we only compassionate when we feel like it? Or is our life decidedly compassionate to others? No matter their situation, no matter their background, how much they may have wronged us and so on. Or do we put edges? Do we put limits on our compassion to others? A Christian's life is decidedly compassionate to others without limitation. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we pray to you now and ask you to show us what limitations we put on compassions? What lines have we drawn? We said, I will be compassionate this far and no further, either because our hearts are not to be bothered, or I think, in, like Jonah's, that he was willing to be compassionate, just not to them. I pray whether our situation be that we are not compassionate because we can't get beyond ourselves, or we can't get, we're not compassionate because we can't get beyond our own biases and our own hatred of people. And I think sometimes we say that word hatred and we can put that far from us. But I think sometimes we need to really say, Lord, if we're not loving, what are we doing to people? I pray, Lord, that you would help us to learn from Jonah's foibles, his mistakes, and to not be Jonah ourself, but to learn and answer that question. What does it mean like to be Christians? What does it mean to be Christ-like in our lives? And what does compassion mean in our lives? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.